Today's readings from the book of John, ch- chapter 13, verse 31 to 35, and you'll find that on page 738 of your Pew Bible. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone know that you are my my disciples, if you love one another. Now we're going to turn to John 1. John 1, chapter 4, verse 7 to 12, page 839 of your Pew Bible. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent this one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Good morning. Great to see you all here today. Thanks for coming out. It seems like I was, uh, next week is the beginning of Advent, which normally I would say, wow, it came on us so quick, but it's already been snowing for like 10 days, so it actually doesn't <laughs> seem like it was that fast. Uh, but what that does mean is, of course, next week is the first Sunday of Advent, and it also means that this week we are doing Christmas decorating, and so we're going to do that tomorrow night. We're going to gather together at six o'clock. We're going to eat together, so if you want to grab dinner with us, uh, we'll have it here at the church, and then we'll do some decorating. It usually takes about an hour, hour and a half, depending on how many people are here, and uh, so we would love to have you come and be a part of that family event tomorrow night. It's a great time. Kids love it. Adults love it, and uh, so we'd love to have you here. Well, the, uh, the last couple of weeks, not couple, probably three weeks or so, we have been looking uh, at some questions that people have about Christianity. And for the most part, they've been questions that are intellectually oriented, questions that try to make sense of Christian teachings for people who are not quite convinced. Well, today is a part of that same series, but it's actually not addressing maybe an intellectual question per se, but probably one that is even more important than that. It's addressing an existential question. Where can I find true belonging? It's one of the most urgent questions of our day, to be honest, and one that the church should be very well equipped to answer. In fact, I'm talking primarily to us, to the church today, not necessarily to people who are skeptics and all of that, because really what matters is not how we answer this question with our mouth, but how we answer it with our actions, with our lives. In our passage today from John chapter 13, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his coming death. And he says something so explicit that I don't know how we ever miss it, how we ever forget about it. And this is what he says, John 13 31. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, I believe that there are some good rational arguments for Christianity, for the reliability of the Bible and all of that. But in this definitive statement, Jesus reorients us by telling us that actually, 
The greatest evidence for the truth of the gospel is loving Christian community. And while we may not have all of the answers to people's questions, and I think you've seen over the last few weeks that, you know, we probably don't have all of the answers. While we, don't have, while we may not have the uh, best produced worship service, we might not have the preaching that's the most captivating, the most important distinguishing mark, and I believe the most attractive aspect of the Christian life, is love in the Christian community. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that people change their minds just as often as a result of changing communities as they do in response to rational arguments. And so Jesus was keying into something that was really important and something that has been true about Christianity, true about humans actually from the beginning, that we are creatures that need to belong before we believe. And we can look in the book of Genesis for this. If you look in the creation story, at the end of each day of creation, God looked at it and he said it was, it was good. And what that means is, is that everything is the way I intended it to be. That's what, that's what it means to say that it was good. But in chapter 2, we see that there is one thing that God said is not good about creation. Maybe you remember it from Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says, it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, I know that this whole thing is kind of a description of marriage, but interpreters all the way back from Jewish rabbis to Christians today say that the more general sense is also true that humans are not meant to go through life alone. And this doesn't just apply to marriage. As humans, we need other humans in our lives to thrive. But we don't even have to go to the Bible to recognize that, do we? We can feel it. We experience it every day. When we don't have that belonging, we miss it. That's what we call loneliness. But the truth is, we don't just need to be around other people to feel like we belong. We can feel alone in a crowded restaurant. We, we crave connection. And when we don't have it, it takes a toll on us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. If you've been to the zoo, how many of you have been to a zoo before? Okay, it's okay, all right, so this one, this one will land, I think, right? <laughs> you, you've probably seen uh, a lion in a pen somewhere, and most likely, if he wasn't just laying in the shade because it was so hot, he was probably pacing back and forth, you know, pacing back and forth uh, with no real purpose. And it's actually a very common scene in zoos, but what you may not know is that lions don't do this in the wild. They only do it in captivity. Uh, and it's actually a condition that zoologists call zoocosis that happens when animals are driven to psychosis from being in captivity. And no matter how many experts they try to bring in to shape their environment, no matter how hard zookeepers work to make their environment more natural, it's still a zoo. And the behavior of the lions is actually their natural response to an unnatural environment, being forced to live in a way that they were never meant to live. There is so much in our world today that is not how we were meant to live. And it creates problems for us. And so we call in experts to try to fix our problems. And actually, they do a pretty good job of it. In fact, you could say that there are many, many different ways in which the world has improved drastically over the last 50 or 100 years. And yet, even in the middle of that, Depression and anxiety continues to rise, and life expectancy has now started to decline. It seems our own zoocosis is setting in. The author, Alan Noble, says that the reason that we can't seem to fix what's wrong with us is that we have a false anthropology, and that's just a fancy word for what it means to be human. We misunderstand what it means to be human and what humans need to thrive. We believe that each of us belongs to ourself that we are isolated, independent entities. And so we engineer a world that caters to individuals at the expense of belonging. And what, is, what are some of the ways that we do this? Well, here, there are a few things. One of them, and I'm sure that you knew that I was going to say this, one of them is that while technology has always been a part of human culture, there's much of, uh, about digital technology today that, have, that we've created that keeps us from living in the way that God intended us. Now, of course, digital technology can be a mixed bag. It can be a very good thing. It can help us feel more connected to people who are far away, for instance. If you're a parent or a grandparent who doesn't live near your family, you know 
that getting on a video chat sometime is really the best thing that you can do. It's a great way to connect. It's a great way to share pictures online with your whole family. But of course, we also know, and studies are showing, the technology, the same technology, can also be very counterproductive. When we get on social media and we check, our, check on our 700 Facebook friends, it gives us the illusion of being connected without the real live connection that we're wired for. And what we see online, of course, isn't always an accurate indication of what's actually going on in their life anyway. When we see, we see the profile that they want us to see, but oftentimes their reality is much different. And of course, we know that our reality is much different than that. And so we compare our real lives to someone else's curated life, and it creates this competition or creates this sense of inadequacy in all of us. And so digital technology can lead to more connections, but not necessarily deeper connections. We're starting to see some of the same things with church live streams. And if you're watching uh, on live stream today, welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, the ability to move online during COVID was a godsend. I mean, literally, it saved many churches. It was a way, it was really the best thing that we could do to stay connected during times when we couldn't gather together. And so it was, it was the best thing that we could do during a difficult time. But studies are now showing that some people got used to watching online and never returned to in-person worship. Eventually, the, even the allure of online worship waned and people even stop doing that. And besides, perhaps the most important part of Sunday worship isn't the content, but it's the community. So our digital technology causes us to live unnaturally. Well, as helpful as social media and other di digital technologies are, the reason that we have them is to try to solve a problem in our society, and the problem is, is that we are a highly mobile society. People used to live their entire lives in the same neighborhood, in the same town, around their families. Uh, but that's become much rarer over the last 50 years. Kids go to college out of state and they stay there for jobs. And that means that, they, that kids and their grandkids spend pretty much their entire adult lives not living anywhere near their family. This is true of my family. I went to college, Went to seminary, grew up, never lived more than, where, well, what we do right now, about four hours. Well, my parents now live in Arizona. So, but other than that, the closest we've lived to our parents is probably three and a half hours away. And so we need those digital technologies to try to help us keep connected. And what it does is all of this moving around makes us feel like we have no anchor in life. Zucosis. And this, of course, is the result of living in a hyper-individualistic society. On the scale of individualist to collectivist societies, the United States is off the charts individualist. We pride ourselves in our independence. We pride ourselves in our can-do spirit. And we don't, feel, we don't want to feel like we need anyone else because we are rugged individualists and we wear that badge with honor. And while, of course, there are some good things about this, it's led to a great amount of innovation in our world and, and things like that, the downside is, is that it also tends to erode social capital. And studies are showing that people in individualistic societies tend to be far more lonely than people who live in collectivist societies. And of course, one that people don't often think about that was brought to our attention in the classic book called Bowling Alone, by uh, the sociologist Robert Putnam. He attributes our lack of belonging in the United States to the decline of clubs and leagues and other organizations that used to bring people together. I can remember just 12 years ago when we moved to Minneapolis, the church softball league that we were in had dozens and dozens of teams, maybe as many as 30 teams. And, uh, and so you couldn't play all of the teams in the league. And I think maybe last year, the last year that we played in that league, I think it maybe had six teams. And now we've moved on to another league and there are just empty ball fields all over the place because they're just not what they used to be. People don't join things the way they did. And this, of course, includes the church. And this is related in my mind, but I think uh, there's a trend away from organized church. It's been pretty well documented, so we don't have to rehash it too much, but a smaller and smaller percentage of people in the U.S. are attending church regularly. In fact, I heard a statistic this week that there are 73 million people in the United States who consider themselves Christian but don't belong to a church. 
Now, it's not any one, any single one of those factors. It's probably a combination of them and maybe countless others that we can think of that, that leads to where we are today. But it leaves us ripe for loneliness and disconnection. We know that we are created to belong to others, but we live in a world that is specifically designed for individuals. So, when it comes to the church, though, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Okay? I want to start with the bad news. The bad news is that when we look at the church as a whole, we really aren't that much different than the world. We are carriers of the disease. We can't complain about the disconnection in the world when it also happens in the church. We buy just as strongly into the individualism of our society. We consume media at the same rate as everyone else. And as I mentioned, even people who consider themselves committed Christians are attending worship service less and less often. And I think all of those things are bad news. But here's the good news. Is that if we understand this, and if we do it right... This can be the church's finest hour. See, I know that there are a lot of doomsayers out there. I see it all the time. The church is declining. By 2050, by 2050, the church in America will be dead. But don't believe it. Why? Because this is God's church. This is not our church. I mean, do we believe that God's presence is with us? Do we believe that God cares about his church? And if so, then why should we be afraid? Yes, these can be challenging times, but what a privilege it is to be here at this moment in history to see what God is going to do. You see, one of the, thi one of the things that our society needs more than almost anything else happens to be the calling card of the church, the invitation to belong. And if we can get this right, the church can be an ark for those who don't feel like they belong. And so the answer to the question is, uh, of, of where can I find true belonging, is Jesus and his church. Now, God is with us, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to work. He calls us, he equips us, but he also gives us a responsibility. And so in our time that we have left today, I want to talk about what it will take for the church to be a place where people can find true belonging, because it doesn't happen automatically. We have failed a lot at it. And so I want to spend the rest of our time talking about that. And let me just focus on, on three things. The first thing, I think, is that we as believers need to realize that when we are saved, we are saved into God's family. Okay? Can I ruffle a few feathers today? Be okay? The Bible doesn't tell us to take Jesus as our personal Savior. How's that? Now, He is that, we do receive forgiveness through Christ for our sins. We each have a choice to make about whether we accept or reject God's offer of grace. That much is true. But to stop at Jesus being our personal Savior shows how much we've bought into the individualism of our day. Okay, let me give you a quick biblical illustration to show this. In the New Testament, it uses the Old Testament exodus, the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, as the model for what salvation is. It's a primary image of salvation. Jesus went to Jerusalem during the Passover and was crucified that week, and he's often called the Lamb of God, which is from the Passover, right? From the exodus. The primary lens that the New Testament looks at salvation through is, is through the Exodus. Now, when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, they did so as a group. They did so as a huge family. But I don't know if you know this or not, but Exodus 12, 38 tells us that there were a lot of non-Israelites who came with them out of Egypt. Did you know that? There were a lot of people who came with them. They were people who said, I want to get out from under the iron fist of Pharaoh, and God honored that desire, and he saved them. But they didn't walk out of Egypt by themselves. They left with the group, with the family of God. In other words, God's salvation came through Israel, and each person had to make that decision of whether or not they wanted to join the people of Israel. Now, one of the questions that we 
got when we were putting this series together. We'd asked people a bunch of questions. Well, what do you have, or what questions do you have about Christianity? And, and one of them that we received was, why do I need to go to church to be a Christian? But even this question reflects the individualism of our day. In the Bible, you never see an unchurched Christian. Also, it's a category error because the church is not something that you can go to. It's something that you are. When you believe in Jesus, you become a member of the church. When you are saved, you are the church. And then your task is actually living into it. All right here's some more scripture. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. He says, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. In other words, the old categories fade into the background and we take on a new category. At the end of the service, we have the privilege of being able to baptize Max Douglas, Maxim Douglas. And uh, baptism, what you'll see, is not just an individual thing. Because when we baptize, we baptized into the church. Or you can look at Ephesians chapter 2, a great passage about the death of Jesus. And look at what Paul writes. He says, consequently, or as a result of the death of Jesus, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of this household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you, are, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. In other words, when you become a follower of Jesus, your identity as a part of God's family becomes your primary identity. And that doesn't mean that you don't have other identities. You don't forsake your family identity, racial, political, or even individual identity. All of those things are fine as long as they take a back seat to your identity in the body of Christ. Now this is a reality. It's a reality that there is a practical benefit of taking on a group identity. Uh, Jim Wilder is a man who calls himself a neurotheologian. Right? He's, a, he's a neuroscientist, also deeply involved in discipleship. He was very good friends with Dallas Willard. And they had a lot of conversations about spiritual formation. And, and da Dallas Willard would draw on scripture and tradition and talk about you know, the old practices of spiritual growth. But Wilder, being a neuroscientist, was always fascinated with how God wired our brains and how that knowledge might help us do discipleship better. And what he found is that one of the reasons that we as a church don't do discipleship better is that we focus too much on information and we focus too much on the individual and our willpower. You see, while information is necessary and we sometimes need to use our willpower when it comes to spiritual growth, God actually wires us so that our identity shapes our character more than any other factor. In fact, it's our group identity that forms us more than any other factor. See, because our brains are wired to be constantly asking this question, and we're not even aware of this. It's a subconscious thing. It, we're asking this question, who are we and how do people like us behave? That's what your mind does even before you can think consciously about it. And that's why peer pressure is always such a strong force, not just for teenagers, but for all of us. And not just for bad, but also for good. So don't be embarrassed because your faith starts to wane if you haven't been around church people for a while. Because that's how you're wired. That's just how it works. And that's why it's so important for you to be around a good, faithful church community. If the church wants to be a place of true belonging, then it starts with embracing our identity as the family of God. So that's the first thing. Okay, the second is that we have to devote ourselves to the practices of the family of God. Okay, it's, not just enough, it's not enough just to see ourselves as a family of God. We have to do the things that the family of God do, does. Uh, over the last few decades in our society, there's been a big push for inclusion. You hear that word all the time. Uh, and people say that inclusion is good and exclusion is bad, and I think this is a good impulse overall. I think there's something that's really, really good about this. I think there's something that very, that's very biblical about it. But there also need to be some limits to inclusion, and here's what I mean. One of the 
reasons that a lot of people reject the church is that they say it's full of hypocrites or they say well, the church doesn't practice what it preaches. But then they see a passage like in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where the Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth that they should excommunicate a sexually immoral man. And people are appalled that the church would excommunicate anyone for any kind of sin. But the problem is, is that you can't have it both ways. If you don't have a way to differentiate between who's in and out of the group, then you don't have a group. Okay? You have nothing. You have just a bunch of individuals. If, you, if everyone's a police officer, you have no police. If everyone's a Democrat, then no one's a Democrat. See, a person can't belong if there's nothing to belong to. Now, the church is not just called to be people who are saved. We're also called to be an example. We're called to be light in the darkness, uh, a nation of priests. The church is called to be a place of refuge for people who are damaged by a sinful world. And how can we be a refuge for people who are damaged by a sinful world if we are just as sinful as everyone else? And so we need boundaries. We need to have a way to be able to differentiate between who's in and who's out. And some of those boundaries can be doctrinal, of course. We have to be able to say, for instance, if you don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you don't believe in the historic creeds, then you're not a Christian. You're not part of this church. If we can't, then the word Christian is meaningless. But they're actually more than doctrinal. They're also behavioral. We have to be able to say, this is our family, and this is how our family lives. Okay, so how should our family live? Well, we should gather regularly for worship and fellowship and prayer. We celebrate things like baptism and communion. We are people who seek to emulate Jesus. We are people who are patient, kind, good, gentle, faithful, self-controlled. We are people who avoid sexual immorality. We do not harbor anger. We care about the poor and needy. We love our neighbor, but we go beyond that to loving our enemies even. And I'm sure there are lots of other things that we could list too. And we say, we are a family and this is what our family does. And so if someone wants to hold on to their pride, if they want to do their own thing, if someone wants to impress other people or cheat or hold grudges, it's probably not a group for them. Now, of course, those are the ideals. Of course, we know that there are people in here that probably break all of those rules from time to time. But we don't kick someone out of a community just because they struggle. We understand that everyone is a work in progress. And so we need to have grace for each other. And of course, if we uh, are doing our jobs and people from outside of the church are coming in and they're feeling like they're be they belong, then we need to have grace for them to be able to learn and to grow and to become more like Jesus over time. And that's why it's not a contradiction for us to say that even while we're sure about our identity, we also have to allow people to belong before they become or even believe. Because the church has to be a community where someone can participate and be accepted even before they're ready to join us fully or identify with us. So those two things are happening at the same time. Okay? We strive to be a distinct community. And we strive to include others and draw them into our community. Over the last 30 or 40 years, churches have tried to convince people to follow Jesus by showing them that we're just like you are. But why would anyone want to be a part of our family if there's nothing different about us? We want to be different. But to do that, we have to take on a different way of life than the rest of the world. And so, to be a place of true belong belonging, I know this is, there's kind of an irony here. In order to be a place of true belonging, we need to see as ourselves as a family, to maintain our distinctiveness. But there's one more thing that can make the church a unique community of belonging. I've been working on my doctoral project very slowly, actually. It's hard to find motivation to do it, but part of my studies is to study something called social identity theory. And one of the main insights of social identity theory is that members of a group tend to strengthen their identity by setting themselves up against an outgroup. In other words, groups bond by having a common enemy. Okay, if you don't believe it, just look at politics today. Okay. It's what people naturally do. 
But being a Christian isn't about doing what comes naturally, is it? Okay, and here's why I believe that the church has a unique opportunity to be the ultimate community of belonging. Okay, and listen carefully because I think this is the key right here. Is because as a church community, Jesus doesn't allow it, right? As the church community, we do not strengthen our identity by setting ourselves up against the world, but by setting ourselves up for the good of the world. Can I say that again? As a church community, we do not strengthen our identity by setting ourselves up against the world, but by setting ourselves up for the good of the world. See, that's because the church is most like the church when it looks like Jesus. And what does the Bible say about Jesus? Well, let me just give you the greatest summary of of Jesus, probably the most common one, one of the best known scriptures in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world, That he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. So, rather than just identifying as a bunch of individual Christians who happen to get together, we form a strong bond and we have a strong family identity, but that identity doesn't cause us to push people away, but to invite them in Because that's what people like us do. As the people of God, we can be the ultimate place of belonging. Because we are the people of eternal hope and optimism because we serve an eternal God that says that one day he will redeem the world. We are the people who recognize that it's only by the grace of God that we are anything. We are the people who can give up our rights for the sake of others because we know that there's a greater future awaiting us. We are the people who do not neglect those who sit on the margins for whatever reason, but we invite them and we include them into the family. We are the people who live for the glory of God and the good of the world. We are the people who believe that there is no one who is unlovable and irredeemable. We are the people who so love God and his people that we want everyone to be a part of it. Now, we have to admit that we have not always lived up to this, have we? But we strive toward it because this is what God says the church is. This is who God says that we are or we ought to be, and we can be a place of true belonging. Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by this, that you love one another. Now, anyone can love people who are like them. Anyone who can love people who share common beliefs, but belonging in the church has to go beyond that. Because our common bond is not common age or interest, it's not common stage of life or personality, it's our common devotion to Christ and His way of life. And so the question today is, is what might you, as an individual, need to change in your mindset or in your practices that we together might become a community of true belonging. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the challenge of your word and this is challenging because even as I even as I speak these words I am so aware of the ways that we fall short. And yet you have put this vision out in front of us that as the Christian community, we are called to love better than anyone else. And so God, I, I pray that that would be our goal. God, I pray that, you would, that, you would, that your Holy Spirit would be working in us and empowering us and teaching us and convicting us of the ways that we have failed to, to live up to being that community where people can belong. God, I pray that more and more we would become that. God, and as we do, I pray that people would see you clearly through us. We thank you that you have brought us together, that you have called us. We thank you even for the responsibility that you have given us to be salt and light in the world. And I pray that we would live up to that high calling. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.